Hello and welcome to the Federal. Today in our studios we have with us author of the book Early Indians, journalist Tony Joseph. Thank you, thank you for having come to our studios. Thank you Venkat, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, about exactly a year back you came out with a book which we could arguably say has settled the debate of 65,000 years. Could you tell us more about this? I think uh, when I started on this book, it had a much more limited objective uh, of uh, figuring out who the Harappans were. That was the original project in my hand. But it expanded and expanded and expanded over the last six years because you realize that you can't answer the question of who the Harappans were unless you figured out who the first uh, farmers of India were who, uh, and who the first Indians were. And uh, I think what this book therefore today tells the story is of how uh, the Indian population formed over 65,000 years ago uh, when the first modern humans or homo sapiens arrived in the subcontinent. And they were, if, if we consider them as the first migration into India, there are three other migrations that happened until about 4,000 years ago at different, po uh, at different points of time. Uh, that all of which, all these four migrations contributed to forming us as we are. So it is the story of how we, uh, we formed as a population. And what is important to bear in mind is that uh, this, was, it was, this, was, this book was possible to be written only in the last, only now. It couldn't have been written a few years earlier because, um, the, because of the major advances made into our understanding of uh, human prehistory across the world because of uh, advances in scientific advances that have happened. So we now have a much clearer understanding of how populations formed in Europe, in the Americas, in East Asia, everywhere in the world, including South Asia. So can we go back to uh, out of Africa, if that's where the story actually began? The earliest evidence of, uh, of uh, fossil evidence of a modern human or Homo sapiens is about is dated to about 300,000 years ago, uh, and that was found in a cave near in in Morocco. And uh, what we now know, so we know that the modern humans, uh, the earliest modern humans, are to be found uh, in the African subcontinent, in the African continent. And what we also know is that all of the rest of the world, all of the non-African world. Uh, was populated by a small mig a migration out of Africa uh, around 70,000 years ago. Around, in, in that period, around 70,000 years ago, a small subset of the African population moved out uh, of Africa into the Arabian subcontinent and then went on to spread all over the world. In, to begin with, it may have been no more than a few hundred people. And, uh, and we know that the last continent that they reached was the Americas, and that happened around 16,000 years ago. So between 70,000 years ago and 16,000 years ago, the small band of people, you know, expanded all over the world. And therefore, if you look at the uh, modern human uh, genomes today, you will find uh, that outside of Africa, the, the diversity is much less of the human genome, modern human genome, compared to Africa because the rest of the population is a subset of the, of the African population that moved out 70,000 years ago. And uh, we also can see from the way uh, fossils are distributed around the world that uh, it is likely that they arrived in India around 65,000 years ago. And uh, how did we arrive at this uh, uh, dating? Uh, dating? I think the dating of when they arrived in India is based on fossils uh, that of modern humans that we have recovered from Southeast Asia and Australia. We know that modern humans were in Australia from, tool, from the tools that they have left behind by about 59,000 years ago. We know that they were in Southeast Asia from fossils that they were there by about 63,000 years ago. So they should have been, ought to have been, since they would have gone through India uh, by at least by 65,000 years ago. To talk about the genetic part of it, all modern humans uh, carry their uh, the entire blueprint in in their cells in in uh, in chromosomes of, of the uh, the DNA and most of the DNA that we carry comes in a mixed form from our parents 
uh, from your and and to use uh, genetic terminology, it it it, 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 it what but it's a result of recombination of. Uh, but there is a small part of our DNA uh, that ca that is uh, inherited from either from mother to daughter to daughter to daughter, which is called the mitochondrial DNA, or from father to son to son to son, which is called the uh, Y chromosome or the Y DNA. And uh, from these, these are only a small parts of our entire genome. But since they come in this form, and since they come uh, in 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 a straight line. And then since they ca sometimes occasionally in that line there are mutations that happen and, uh, and therefore we can see and then those mutations are carried by all subsequent generations and there could be further mutations down the line. So we can from these mgDNA and Y chromosome we can figure out branches or what, what are called haplogroups uh, that we carry and since we have mapped the haplogroups of modern humans around the world you can identify uh, from haplogroups where they come from and where, which. Uh, so, so it is possible to trace the ancestry back thousands, thousands of years ago. And we can also date when certain branches emerged because there is a certain regularity uh, to the way that mutations happen. So that is how we know uh, that uh, it is by tracing these uh, family trees and that, that is how we know. Uh, that uh, mod all modern humans outside of Africa uh, are a subset, come from a subset of the African population and that they are likely to have moved out of Africa around 70,000 years ago. Talking of ancient uh, DNA, uh, I mean there, there seems to be a little bit of confusion or I don't know misrepresentation. I remember your book talks about the, I mean uh, what you meant, this ASI and ANI and this is, these are uh, theoretically admixed, right? Is, yeah. is, right? So, but could you talk more about what, what, were there these two separate uh, set of DNAs, uh, the, the Rakigiri uh, uh, example for example, uh, you know, I think that also fits in with your, to an extent, I mean to what uh, uh, you have mentioned. The migration history of India has to be situated within the migration history of the world. Uh, and we need to look at what insight have we gathered into how human populations everywhere formed. And I think because one of the obvious questions that would arise to anyone's mind is there are migrations that happen all the time in all places. So how do we disentangle this? The, the answer is that there is a way to disentangle this because we can see from what we have known so far there are essentially four classes of migrations uh, that shaped human populations in all parts of the world by and large. And these four classes of migrations were driven by global forces uh, in the sense that when we look back we can see why those migrations happened when they did. For example, the out of Africa migrations uh, ha uh, were driven by, by climatic factors like migrations of all other, uh, all other beings. Uh, so that it is uh, the glacial age and the opening up of certain routes to a large extent uh, that determined when modern human population group uh, moved out when, when we come to the out of Africa migrations. The second class of migrations happen when some modern human populations, population groups took to agriculture in different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, you see as the out of Africa migrants were spreading out across the world between 70,000 and 16,000 years ago, there was a glacial age that intervened between around 29,000 years ago and about uh, 12,000 or 13,000 years ago. And, uh, and that glacial age meant large parts of the world became uninhabitable and modern human populations got separated from each other and th so they started developing along slightly different lines accumulating minor genetic differences. Uh, we should remember that 99.9 percent .9 of all, uh, all modern humans share 99.9 percent .9 of, of their DNA. So the differences are minor but they did so that is what happened. And when the glacial age uh, uh, ended and the world started warming up again what you see are humans, modern humans in different parts of the world experimenting with agriculture. And some, and the earliest agriculture may well have been uh, that of tubers and uh, banana 
in, in Southeast Asia. But you see not all uh, experiments with agriculture were successful, not all that were successful were sustainable, and not all that were sustainable uh, were necessarily highly productive, didn't change lifestyles. For example, we now know that banana plantation tubers didn't, didn't deliver the kind of productivity that led on to huge advanced changes in, in, in huge changes in lifestyle. But those people who were lucky enough to be in regions where they had the opportunity to domesticate cereals, wheat, rice, barley, they were in a much more uh, advantageous position because these, are, these yield high productivity and then people can change their lifestyle, they can actually settle down. And when people settle down, these are modern human population groups such as in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in India, in China, when they settle down and they start farming, their populations simply explode. There is no comparison between the way population expands in a farming community compared to a hunter-gatherers. Hunter -gatherers. Hunter -gatherer population grow very slowly. So these huge population expansions across multiple regions led to huge migrations that changed the demography. When would have agriculture come to the Gangetic Plains? And uh, let me, let me, I would like oh, to sorry, finish this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is the second class of migrations, which is the uh, agricultural migration. Third class of migrations began when some uh, modern human population troops in Central Asia hmm. uh, figured out how to ride a horse and combined that with mastery of a metallurgy. And uh, these, this uh, gave them huge mobility across a vast expanse of the globe. Uh, and they moved into Europe into uh, West Asia, of course Central Asia, South Asia, even up to China. And that changed the demography of a whole part, whole range of the, uh, the uh, whole, uh, whole very large part of Eurasia. That's the third class of migrations. And the fourth class we know are the colonial migrations, which changed the demography of the uh, Americas and uh, we know Australia. Uh, as for now we come to India. We know that as far as India is concerned, the last, uh, the fourth yeah. class of migration did not leave a large mark because the number of uh, colonialists who arrived in India were very small compared to the existing very large population. So they, that did not leave a large mark either. And uh, that is true of all other uh, migrations that we learn about in history, the Huns, the Sakhas, the Arabs, the Mughals, the Persians, whomever. They all uh, might have left a mark on our culture and our history but in terms of, uh, of the genetic impact, they left very little uh, mark. It's a very important point. A very yeah. important point. So the, our, the, the Indian population consists, is the result of these four... Uh, um, classes of, of, of... Yeah, these three classes of migrations yeah. and four migrations. <laughs> because agriculture-related class of migrations, there were actually two migrations, one from West Asia and one from East Asia. So you had the out-of-Africa migrations, one uh, agricultural related expansion from West Asia uh, and uh, another one from East Asia and of course the uh, migration from Central Asian steppe. So this is the population composition of the, uh, of, so of the Indian population and no matter where in the caste hierarchy you are, no matter what uh, language you speak, no matter what region you inhabit, if you are in uh, if you are an Indian, India in the old sense of the word of standing for all of South Asia, you will find that all population groups in this region are a combination of these four uh, migrations in different proportions, of course. But that's, the, that's our history. And we can also say the period, 65,000 years ago for the out of Africa migrants to have reached here, around 12,000 years ago or so for the agriculture, uh, for the migrations that led to uh, the expansion of agriculture in northwestern India about 4,000 years ago or later for the migrations from East Asia that brought Austroasiatic languages such as Khasi and Mundari that are spoken by tribals in central India and eastern India and of course uh, between 4,000 years ago and 3,500 years ago that is 2000 BCE to 1500 BCE that brought Central Asian migrants who spoke Indo-European uh, okay. languages who called themselves Aria and uh, that changed the, the language of uh, northern India. So these are the four migrations that shaped us.
why is that or at least a section of people including uh, you know the British uh, uh, historians who referred to this as the Aryan invasion uh, rather than uh, using you know migration per se. No, I use the term Arya uh, migration and not Aryan invasion because there is no uh, archaeological evidence uh, for an invasion. Uh, we do know that there was a migration uh, from the genetic and other evidence and linguistic evidence. Uh, so until there is, uh, we have evidence to show that it was uh, that it was an invasion. It wouldn't be correct to call it an Aryan invasion. The earlier assumption that there was an Aryan invasion that destroyed the yeah. Harappan civilization and pushed everybody downwards. Now we know that that is inaccurate because. We know that the Harappan civilization, at least one of the major factors that caused the decline of the Harappan civilization was climate. Climate that changed a long drought uh, that seriously affected not just the Harappan civilization, but also other civilizations around the time. So this we know for a fact. And uh, secondly, we also know from genetics that the Harappans did not just move to uh, South India. They moved east towards what is today North India and towards South India, carrying with them the their language, which is likely to have been a Proto-Dravidian language uh, that they spoke, and their culture and the practices that had been perfected in the Harappan civilization across with them. In many ways, it's the Harappan civilization we can see as the glue that holds us together. Many things that we see commonly across the, uh, across the subcontinent originate in the Harappan civilization, which is pre aryan or pre-migration from the Central Asian steppe. And uh, so that's why. So it is... Uh, it's incorrect to uh, say that it's uh, that that an Aryan invasion destroyed the Harappan civilization. We do not have proof of it. While we do have proof of the fact that there was a, the a climatic change that changed the, uh, the the fortunes of the Harappan civilization, and that people did move both towards the south and towards east into North India, and that uh, the Harappans in many ways uh, not only holds us together culturally. Uh, it's also the genetic ancestors of most of the Indian population. They are our ancestors, no yes. matter where you are, and except that their linguistic heritage uh, just today continues in South India, because in North India, uh, the language of the people shifted to the more dominant newly arrived Indo-European languages, while in the South they continued and thrived. So the example of the proto zagrosan and proto dravidian uh, yeah. i mean uh, your book notes some very fine examples i mean yeah. you could please uh, could you just for the benefit of our viewers talk yeah. about them just briefly yeah just uh, i will just pick one uh, this is uh, not uh, it's about you know there were very strong trade relations between the harappans and the mesopotamian uh, kingdoms and the mesopotamian civilization to some sometimes they were even involved in their internal quarrel, quarrels so it's they, these were very close trade relations. And we know that the Mesopotamian civilization at some point in their uh, cycle started cultivating sesame. And sesame is a crop that grows in the Indus Valley in India, not in West Asia. So it is clearly an import from the Indus Valley uh, into Mesopotamia like many other things. We know, for example, there are water buffaloes that you can see on the seals of Mesopotamia. And water buffalo is from the Indus. Uh, valley, not it's not a natural yeah. inhabitant of West Asia. So there are many other things that were imported because they were close trade relations. And but this the story of the sesame is particularly important because in the language that was spoken there at then Akkadian, what's the name? Uh, what, what's the name of the sesame seed that they took from the Indus Valley? It's called Erlu, and Erlu is the precisely the same word. Uh, that we use for sesame in Dravidian languages. It's not the same word that's used in Indo-European uh, languages. So the, the fact that when an actual, uh, there was an actual import of a crop from uh, Indus Valley into Mesopotamian civilization, it carried a name that is Dravidian in origin, uh, I think is stunning. Thank you very much, Tony, for having visited our studios and talked about such a fascinating subject. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Venkat. It has been a pleasure.